So we want to uh, talk, I know you're very passionate about mm. listening to the community, which is one of the values we spoke about earlier. What does listening to, to the community look like? I think um, I want to pick up on, on Gary's point about partnerships. If, um, if Love Where You Live is about partnerships, then it's really vital that we see the community as a partner. Mm. Um, in our work, um, too often we find communities feel that their experience is being done to. Yes. That uh, you know, people from the outside, well-meaning people, come from the outside and try and fix the problems of a community, but without really talking to people. Um, and that can lead to things just being going wrong. Mm. Um, so for, for us, there are three core principles about listening. Uh, it's about dignity, it's about agency, and it's about power. Um, so th in terms of dignity, it's really important to recognise that everybody in a community, every person, is already made in the image and likeness of God. Mm. They have intrinsic dignity. The problem is they don't experience uh, being treated with dignity too often. Mm. That they're, um, they're looked down on, particularly when we're talking about poverty or communities that feel marginalised. They're stigmatised. Mm and they're seen as a problem, quite often they're even blamed for being in poverty. And that's a terrible burden to bear. So it's really vital if we're going to partner with communities and listen to communities, that we do it in a way which recognises and affirms people's dignity. And that's about um, deep listening. Mm. It's about uh, meeting people where they are, recognising they're a whole human being, they're not just a problem. You can't stick them in a box and say, this person's got food poverty. That might be part of their story. But their story, they, they're bound to have a lot more in their story. So you've got to actually spend time deep listening. Mm. Uh, you've got to do it in a way which builds trust. Um, people don't automatically trust you. You can be completely well-meaning. Mm. You know, we are, we, we've got every, you know, the best intentions. But for a, a person or a community that's been felt it's been let down so often, you can't assume that they will start from a position of trust. I worked with uh, some folk in Salford, and only after a year did Laura say to me, you're safe, Neil. And I thought, that's fantastic but it took a year before she really trusted mm. that I had her best interests at heart. And I wasn't another of these outside, well-meaning, you know, uh, uh, professionals, middle-class folk coming in that wasn't really going to listen. Mm. I think you brought out a fascinating point there about the longevity of what we're trying to mm. do. We may do a social action project, which is a, um, over just a few weeks or a weekend, but what we really want to do is impact people's lives in the yeah. longer term. Um, and it could well be that Festival Manchester almost kickstarts something that then we as church need to follow through. Oh, because it takes time, it doesn't takes time. it? Yeah, and I think the festival's a great opportunity to start a conversation. Yeah. And you know, it, a lot of it is conversational. It's yes. not workshops. People don't come to workshops. People don't come to meetings. They have chats. Yes. So, you know, put on some food. <laughs> I thought food might be mentioned. Um, All good some projects food, have food. Have, some, no, have a cup of tea. Have a chat. That's what yes. people, people instinctively... What, that's what we're doing, isn't it? We're having a chat. People like a chat, but they like a chat with somebody where it's a two-way conversation. If you're not going to give anything of yourself in that conversation, then it's not a conversation. Yes. Um, I think you're bringing out um, the, the whole listening piece, listening to people and the conversation. And it also, it's something we can all do, this. It's not um, a full-blown project, as it were. It's just starting with the conversation. And some of us might be thinking, I know I can have a coffee with somebody and I can have a conversation. But I want to ask you a bit more about the whole, um, the end, ending food poverty, mm. 
the food hubs, the yeah. pantries. Um, the, we know about the community groceries as well that the Message Trust have. Those, is food poverty getting worse, as it were? We've always had food poverty, but is it, is it worse through this last several years? Or is it, you know, what would you like to say about that? Um, it's definitely got worse. Mm. Um, I, I think we could have a long conversation about what food poverty looked like 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, Church Action on Poverty is 40 years old. And I look back, and the word food poverty hardly featured in conversations and reports we produced 20, 30 years ago. Mm. Poverty was certainly around, but the fact that people are now going without food, the level of poverty, the depth of poverty, uh, and that is going to get worse. We know the, the cost of living crisis. Mm. Uh, food is going up, fuel is going to go up massively. Yeah and people will be struggling. People that aren't currently struggling or on the just about managing uh, yes. that phrase, they will be tipped further in. So there are, in any community now, people uh, that are struggling. And that's not just the likes of Withenshaw, you know, affluent communities, people are struggling. Mm. And that's also really hard because in an affluent community, you're not expecting people to be struggling people will put on a show because they feel the stigma yeah um and uh another story i remember elizabeth from south wales we did some work with she was a member of her local church and she went a whole winter without any heating in her house and she didn't feel she could t tell anybody in her congregation mm. about it because she felt shame yeah and all it took was somebody to have a conversation actually hear what she was saying in a safe space where this wasn't going to be you know tittle tattle around the whole church and uh got an electric heater because her you know her central heating had broken yeah so very simple things but th the reality of food poverty yeah it's in every community now and the, for us the key thing is how do we tackle it well actually we don't tackle it we work with people to tackle it together Mm, mm. So for us, what's really important about pantries or groceries is their member food clubs. It's not a food bank. It's not people coming yes. for charity. That's for people that are absolutely in crisis. That's fine. But a pantry or other things we do, it's about creating the space for people to come together. This is the agency bit. Yes. That if we think our role is to fix everybody's problems for them, then we're part of the problem. Yes. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that, the, 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 the grocery model, the, um, the community grocery and the pantry model seem to be really inspiring people across the UK right now, making such a huge mm. difference. But just to back up the point that you were making earlier on about um, the fuel crisis, the, 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 the poverty that people are experiencing, and we did a community listening project we call it a rock conversation in witness a few about a year or so ago and there's there was some senior staff there from mcdonald's and i was quite intrigued as to why they'd come but they wanted to be part of that mm. conversation so getting businesses involved i think is a really key thing there and they came up to me at the end and they said deborah can we ask you where do people go when they feel lonely and I said, oh, I'm guessing you're going to say McDonald's. And it turned out that people, their staff are saying that people will go to McDonald's for a whole day mm -hmm. with one coffee and part of it was because they can't afford to have their heating on at yeah. home. And it really showed um, me that this, this problem is something that almost needs to be addressed by, by us all. So coming to the grocery model, the community grocery pantry model, I can see you've got so many in the network here. Um, that reinforces your point about showing dignity, doesn't mm. it? Because it is the opportunity to get to know people and people come along and purchase uh, the food for, for a lower yeah. price. Is that, is that the basic model That's the, of it? So the basic model... They don't actually buy the food, but they pay a weekly membership fee. Right, OK. But the key thing is there's, there's some money involved. So then yes. it's not a handout. OK. People join. They, the dignity that people have, that they're part of this 
pantry or, or grocery, yes. that they've contributed something as well, even if it's, it's three or four pounds, that's, uh, that changes the relationship in, entirely. And also that they can choose the food that they want. Yes. And it's good quality food. It's fresh fruit and veg. It's chilled and frozen. So it's everything you would want from a, a weekly shop. And it feels like a shop. It doesn't feel like you're going to a kind of, you know, a charity. And it's not, I don't think it's means tested, does no. it? So, so it, people can choose to go there. And, um, and again, what's fascinating is we don't have to do a lot of work to promote pantries. You get a few people through the door and they're the best people that will then, they'll tell their so friends, their neighbours, the networks people have in the community. So that's, that's how communities work. Um, people will, will bring their friends along because it's such a good thing. And it then becomes a good news story in that community. It's not, oh, I've got to go to the pantry this week. It's come along to the pantry. So mm. when, we, when we did some work uh, a year or two ago asking people what they got from the pantry, actually the food, I mean, it's, it's, it's about food, but it's, in some ways it's not about food. It's about dignity and choice and hope and uh, a sense of being part of a community, tackling social isolation. For some people, they come an hour before the pantry opens. Uh, there's a cafe to come and meet, so they're not on the, on the street. But that was their social activity of the week. Mm. And they, make, they come every week and they meet and make friends with mm. people at the pantry. So that, again, it's creating the space for people to build their own dignity and agency, which is really important, that we can create those spaces, yeah. we can host those spaces, but the community is, is, is a complete partner in the project. It's their pantry, so it's, yes. it's, it's your local pantry. It's not our pantry that you're coming to. You're a member of this, and you can volunteer at it. And for some of the churches that have gone from food banks to pantries, um, it's transformed their relationship with their community because mm. suddenly there are people coming through the doors of the church and saying this is our place yeah. and uh, we're Absolutely. so glad we're here and so you know, can we help, can we volunteer and that's the start of a whole different relationship with that, that community for that, that church. I can think of one in Portsmouth, uh, North End Baptist Church. There's a lovely video online if people want to look for it yeah. where they, they went on that journey as a church and they're so buzzed with how that's transformed their relationship with their local community. That's incredible. Um, so today we're talking a little bit about love where you live and that idea of social action, creating that environment for people to uh, possibly receive the love of Jesus Christ, which we'd all love mm. to see happen in people's lives. But talk a little bit about, um, just as we come to a close, just talk, talk to us a little bit about um, how does that happen? How is this part of the gospel? Festival Manchester is where we wanted to share the love mm. of Jesus with people. We want to do that as churches. How does that pantry model or that community grocery model fit with that? How is it showing the love of Christ to people? So I think this is where, for me, this is, it's transformational of a church's relationship with its community. Right. It creates that space for relationship. But I also think it even goes beyond that. Um, the radical idea is that God is already active in that community, in those people. Mm -hmm. And creating the space for people to come together, for me, in terms of anti-poverty work or in terms of the, the mission of the church, that people can be part of transforming their own lives, that that's also part of the good news story. Mm -hmm. And if you read the Bible, that's also people encountered Jesus and they acted. Uh, mm -hmm they took the action out of their own faith. So it unlocks something it, that's it, perhaps potential and now is being unlocked through that bringing together of people. And, and also in the communities that we're talking about, that the good news is in that community. Those communities yes. are too often told, you're a failing community, you're a sink estate, you're problems. And that's not what the gospel is. It's not, we're bringing the gospel from somewhere else to this place. The gospel is there and Christians are already part of that community. And again, too often, mm. the assumption is that these are kind of godless places. And actually, that's so far from the truth. Yes. Uh, people have faith, deep faith. Sometimes they've been let down by the church. That's true. Um, and that's true. You know, churches have pulled out of those communities, but faithful people have stuck there and lived their lives. And 
if we can see the potential of people and communities, as, as I said, from the, as God-given, their talents need to be unlocked. Yes. Um, and that, for me, is, is fantastic good news. And they can then help transform their communities and wider. So the last thing I want to talk about very briefly is Poverty Truth Commission, which is a, a, a year-long process, so you couldn't start this straight off. But that's bringing people in struggling against poverty into a room with decision makers, yeah. council, business, uh, NHS, police. And what's fascinating there is the truth is revealed by everybody sharing their bit of it. Mm. And the transformation often comes from people that are in, thought of as um, the problem, the ideas they can generate for how we can transform our communities, if we have access to the power and resources to do it. They're just amazing spaces. Um, and such, for me, again, such good news. Mm. Um, so um, it's about the transforming power of people themselves and communities themselves, which is where we need to tap into, uh, yes. rather than assume it's, we've got to bring the good news to this place. Yes. Um, and then the space for faith conversations I, as part of that. Yes. Um, and absolutely. And it's fundamental that the church doesn't abandon these communities and worshipping yes. communities need to be part of those communities so Amazing. that comes from relationship as you've been speaking i keep thinking of a, a bible a verse in the bible just keeps standing out i think it's john 10 10 which talks about the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but jesus said i have come that you might have life in all its fullness mm -hmm. and it feels like a bit like there's, there's, there's so much bad news around poverty, about, around the fuel crisis and the war and, you know, these difficult things that we're facing. But Jesus coming to have, to give people fullness of life, to give people dignity, to give people hope. And, that, and that's, that's what we want to not just celebrate this summer, but for the rest of our lives, we as Christians, we want to be that good news, Jesus. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Neil. We, we, love, we love what you've had to say. 